Let us start this lecture about the material technology and we will be discussing basically about metals and metallurgy in ancient India. If you recall that in the last uh, 31 lectures, we have uh, basically discussed about uh, glimpses of ancient Indian science and technology. Later on, we moved to the agriculture and uh, then subsequently to the housing and textile and of course, uh, towards end we are discussing about water management system in ancient India. And today we will be uh, discussing about metal and materials and let us um, look at uh, basically wonderful world of materials. And when you talk about materials uh, that plays a very important role in uh, not only in ancient India and also in the present time because we are now. Uh, having the materialism which is very predominant in our life. But if you look at the Indian philosophy, they are always for the material, but not that blatant materialism that is going on. So, uh, I will uh, be trying to draw your attention to the philosophy of Sankhya, which was uh, very uh, much talking about uh, what you call Prakriti and Purusha. When you talk about Prakriti is basically material. And if you look at like uh, our uh, way of life, what is being uh, talked about in the Indian philosophy is um, basically the dharma, artha, kama, moksha. If you want to realize the artha and kama, then you need to play with the materials and material plays an important role. When you talk about materials, basically we need to understand what is the basic science in it and also how to utilize the understanding for developing certain technology which will be achieving the uh, you know desire and also the earth the material kind of things so that uh, are the needs so that you can achieve your the ultimate goal that is the moksha. So, uh, when you talk about this prakriti we are a part of the nature mother nature and keep in mind that mother nature is a great designer of all the materials what we see and also their uh, you know various uh, products. And uh, modern science and technology try to uh, what you call mimic them not in a very nice way, but at least attempted to uh, you know copy it and, and also spoiling certain process. And when you talk about this also we need medicine and materials are uh, you know uh, important so far preparation of medicine uh, which is required for a health of not only the human beings also the other living and non-living beings around the world. So, therefore, we need to take care of the um, mother nature as a whole as we are a part of it. So, we, uh, we need to look at the uh, you know uh, metal and metallurgy in that part. Let us look at the world of materials and in ancient times the materials uh, being used uh, can be uh, classified into four categories. One is metal and other is ceramic, polymer and composite. If you look at metal, the various kinds of metal are being uh, were being used in ancient India. Of course, uh, we are always uh, being fond of gold and silver apart from copper and uh, also the iron and beside this there are alloy, alloys uh, various kinds of alloys kind of thing like your bronze and then brass and several other things. Ceramic of course was being used earlier days in various forms like your if you look at we talk about the potteries and then glass and several other things we use so ceramic comes into polymer. Uh, were being used earlier, but most of them are uh, derived from the what you call biology or the uh, polymers were uh, basically from the natural polymers or uh, polymer was a natural nature unlike in modern time where we use unnatural polymers. Nowadays people are talking about biodegradable polymer that is why. But when you combine all these 
kind of things uh, together you get may get another material which is basically composite that means will be uh, you know various combination one can think of like metal and ceramic you can think of composites also metallic ceramic and polymer various permutation combination you can in ancient india you may get some of the examples of composite material for example like um, brick making in the brick itself we use the ceramic the clay and uh, beside this we will be using some kind of a sawdust and uh, other things even i was told that um, people were having the bow made of composite materials earlier times which was a very light in weight and uh, and also uh, the accurate in uh, in their flexibilities for uh, this thing and uh, beside this for the wall and even for motors and uh, other uh, kind of ingredients you know composites are being used so uh, if you look at uh, although the today materials have uh, you know improved a lot and then it uh, varieties are there but earlier time most of the things were natural in nature not they were making themselves or although they are processing but they were not uh, designing them you know uh, uh, what you call the way it is being done in modern time so uh, now uh, a question might be coming to your mind that does india have a strong metallurgical background in ancient time certainly yes uh, we look at the background of it uh, for uh, uh, and look at historic chronological order how it was developed if you look at uh, 100 million to 4000 bc there is a basically pre harappan period where people were using the gold copper possibly maybe uh, meteoric iron kind of things and of course the 3500 bc onwards like you know indus valley civilization where people were using uh, you know silver lead arsenic copper and also of course uh, you know other uh, maybe but also their alloys uh, being used uh, for their day to day affairs of course indus valley civilization was agricultural really mostly but apart from that they have also used some all these metals and it was also being talked about they were knowing uh, the foundry you know technology because of if you recall that i had shown you earlier a, a dancing girl um, statue which was basically cast in and uh, more research has been going on today also to find out how they were doing events uh, i was told uh, that uh, the last wax cast method which is also known as investment casting was also there in the during the indus valley civilization and if you uh, come to the vedic period which is around 1500 to 2000 bc apart from the silver gold and uh, other coppers and uh, other alloys they were started using iron profusely and also the steel and uh, metal works were developed and besides the, they were also using the distillation process and of course uh, later on the 600 bc onwards that is um, there is a rise of magadha there is a, a various amalgamation of the metals were being done and uh, they also had developed some soldering technique and brass gildings because they have started using also brass in a number of ways so uh, if you go to the buddhist period something around 500 bc onwards and it was uh, being mentioned that uh, wood steel was uh, developed at that time matter and atomic theory was also developed during that time if you go to the uh, mauryan dynasty particularly from chandragupta and ashoka and other things the 321 to 180 for bc there is a uh, method of uh, you know cupellation they had uh, found out and beside this they had uh, other refining technology cupellation is a basically refinery uh, process of separating the precious metal like gold silver from the base metal in which uh, you know like uh, ores or alloyed metal are oxidized to uh, high temperature and the base metals are separated by uh, absorption into the walls of cupel we will be discussing little bit more about cup cupellation later on and 600 to 700 CE, uh, you will find the, of course, the northern portion was invaded by Huns, and then, of course, in south, southern portion, Chalukyas and Chola Empire were existing. 
there is extensive use of iron, steel, even mercury, zinc apart from your copper, gold, silvers and other things. Of course, house and sea uh, in the northern was subjected to Afghan's raid and a lot of things lost in the process. Of course, uh, the southern site was not affected and lot of uh, you know metal works were going on in the southern side uh, of the country. And uh, 1100 C Hoysala is a very big empire and then you know like uh, brass and bronze casting was profusely used in the uh, southern part of the India apart from the uh, other uh, usual metal work. And uh, of course, uh, during uh, 1300 to 1572, uh, Mughal Sultanate was uh, there in the northern India and while the Vijayanagar Empire was in the southern part and uh, both were using the metals and metal crafts uh, for preparing for the war, making guns and apart from your jewellery and other day-to-day uh, -to -day materials. So, of course, later on 1498 to 1707, like uh, there was the industrialization of iron, steel, brass and bronze and um, I think the British also enter into these pictures along with the French people and there is of course a war in between the British and also the Tipu Sultan uh, during 1605 to 761 and uh, this is of course the British Empire time and where modern metal technology were used for making the rockets and also the iron guns were being uh, developed. So, if you look at the metal and metallurgy basically was a part and parcel of Indian life in ancient time. So, uh, if you look at archaeometallurgical evaluation method at this moment if you want to do then you will have to follow certain principles that is occurrence of mineral and their processing technology one has to identify not only that also details regarding excavation sites, settlement and industries one has to also look at, one should have some experience in the related field so that you can identify what are the things going on and evaluation of socio-economic networks, what was prevailing at that time and also we need to look at what was the environment at that time which was instrumental for the uh, growth of the technology, what it was prevailing uh, in ancient time. So, when you look at the study, you will have to look at in a totality, not in isolated manner. So, that is the important message we need to learn and it is not only for the metallurgy, but for other things, other technologies as well. If you look at the life cycle of archaeological metallic artifacts, what we can get and identify and then try to find out that when it was, how it was being fabricated and how it is evolved. Then of course, the natural world that uh, provides the basically ore and once we get the ore, we will have to uh, smelt it and when you smelt it, there will be also the slag which will be produced, right. And uh, out of this uh, smelting, we can get the bloom and then uh, when we smith, also we get the slag. See, if you look at the slag, again we will be coming out of the smithing and we can produce some artifacts and artifacts when you use uh, like you can use and then you can discard also, but you can also preserve it right and uh, you may lose it and when you do that like it can be you know all these three things can be again coming to the potential artifacts and when you talk about this potential artifacts it may corrode or there might be some corrosion, if there is a corrosion it may go back to the natural world, right? It may go back to the natural world due to corrosion, right? And uh, of course, these potential artifacts you can recover, you can analyze it, right? You can display it. After recovering these uh, potential artifacts, you can display it, you can analyze, analyze it to find out what are the components. I have put that thing in a little uh, you know cycle manner that not that the way it is linearly it is being shown in this. So, if you look at when you talk about these artifacts basically it will be used and it can be also what you call when you use you can discard also right you can discard it. And when you uh, discard you may also lose it. And when you, uh, there might be a, some uh, uh, loss 
and then we will go to the uh, potential artifacts and then we can reuse it also that is another way and once you do it reuse uh, because the discard it will be reused then you can get to the smithing and smithing when you talk about there might be a slag right uh, whole cycle it goes on. So, by that way one can look at this you know archaeological metallic artifacts to find out how good or uh, how bad and then for your analysis. Now, let us look at a brief history of the Indian metallurgy and of course, uh, there was a metallurgy in the Indus Valley civilizations what we are calling now Indus Saraswati civilization or uh, Hindi me kehte Sindhu Ghati Sabhata right. And uh, as per the R S Sarma in 1988 has uh, written an article on historical archaeology of India. Of course, I have taken that from the history of technology India volume 1 edited by A K Bagh uh, Insa New Delhi. According to R S Sarma, several metals were being used for making various tool, tools for agriculture, defense and transport by land and sea. And uh, he has given lot of examples Rig Vedas, Shrutis and Yadur Vedas. That is another author also Prakash mentioned the importance of fire discovery for processing of metals and uh, the Rishi Angirasa uh, is considered to be the discoverer of fire because fire is the prime over of the all the civilization what we can think of. So, therefore, uh, also he uh, has mentioned that the Yagya Kundas or the fire uh, places like was a open laboratory where lot of uh, experimentation might have been done, but and they might have learnt a lot about the metal and metal processings, uh, but unfortunately they did not uh, write down uh, in a very systematic manner except in a very cryptic way they have mentioned in the Vedas. There might be uh, the reason is that like uh, people uh, were transferring the knowledge from one generation to another, but in their own clan or in their own family, but they were not uh, giving to others that might be one of the reason why you know they did not write it down very elaborate way. And even that kind of mindset is prevailing today, and because why I am saying with confidence um, uh, one of my student uh, who is from uh, Trivandam like he, his family was having a um, what you call technology of making the idols using the lost works method. And I asked them to make a video uh, for this course and then uh, so that we can show, but he told it cannot be done because it is secret. So, therefore, uh, even today it is happening. So, it might be the one reason what uh, Prakash uh, has mentioned and uh, beside this uh, uh, if you look at native metals like gold, silver, copper, iron have been the first to be discussed as early as 6000 to 1 million year BC in India that he has claimed. And uh, of course, you will get a lot of information about the metal and metallurgy in the Arthasastra. Although, uh, if you look at earlier days people are using arrow kind of things here right and uh, arrow and the bow. And uh, some people say that the, the bow will be little flexible in nature, but arrow will have a, this is the metal. So, uh, which were being very much you know uh, being used in ancient India if you go to our uh, mythological stories and other things you will find that uh, our warriors were carrying the uh, bow and arrows. If you look at the Arthasastra which is the one of the earliest Indian text has mentioned about uh, mineralogical characteristics of metallic ores, other mineral aggregate rocks and I will be discussing some of them. And uh, of course, they have not described the way modern people are familiar with, but however, from their description one can find out that those are the these materials. It recognizes also the ores in the earth, in the rocks or in the liquid form with excessive color, heaviness and often strong smell and taste. These are the things they were using for characterizing the uh, ores and materials like a color, heaviness or a smell, taste. So, um, and he has mentioned a gold bearing ore in that text. In the similar manner, silver 
ore was uh, described in Arthasastra, which uh, seems to be a complex sulphide uh, ore containing silver and they uh, mentioned that uh, you know this ore will be having color of a con cell and uh, they have also talked about the camphor and uh, bimalaka or pyrites. The Arthasastra describes the sources and qualities of good grade coal and silver ores. Gold smelting was known as a Subanna Paka, you know like Paka means basically cooking and they are talking about uh, cooking of the you know gold that is the Subanna Paka. As I told that you know this is the gold ore which uh, you know looks like uh, the whatever the description they have given in the uh, text of the Arthasastra. So this is about copper ore and uh, you know the color wise you can see and from this one can identify. In the, according to the Arthasastra by Kotalya, the copper wires were stated to be heavy and greasy and tunny and this if it is uh, of course um, kind of this thing then it is a one can identify that color as to be chalcopyrite left exposed to air uh, and then gets tarnished. And there might be some other varieties of copper ore that is a green color of malachites and there is a dark blue with yellowish tint azurites and pale red native coppers. There are various kinds of copper ores are being mentioned in the Arthasastra text. Lead ores were stated to be a grayish black like kaka meka means color of uh, galena. If you look at the galena you know is uh, looks like that is the lead ore. And uh, you know this uh, kaka meka, the color of uh, galena is a black, grayish black. It looks to be the similar one that of the galena, right? And there are some other things like yellow, like Pisian bile, marked with white lines, quartz or calcite, gang minerals, and uh, smelling like a raw flesh, odor of sulphur. You know they have uh, having these characteristics to identify the ore which happens to be the you know lead. So iron ore was known to the greasy stone of pale red color or the color of a sindhu or a flower or a hematites. Of course there are various kinds of uh, you know iron ores uh, are mentioned in uh, some other text which I will be discussing little later on when we will be talking about iron and its uses. So, Arthasastra also describes system of coinage based on silver, copper. They are having a very standard units of measuring the weight of uh, these materials in a silver and copper coin. They use masaka, half masaka, quarter masaka uh, known as kakni and half kakni also. Like if you look at uh, they were having using for gold a different kind of uh, masakas and then for silver different kind both are not same uh, weight kind of things. And copper coins progressively lower weights you know as compared to the silver at same composition like one cutter of hardening alloys and rest copper. So you know copper they might have uh, used a you know alloy as a, a coin. And uh, let me show you a coins for Ahsoka. This is a basically a silver coins which were made during the time of Ahsoka. And when you uh, talk about this metallurgy of pure metals in uh, India, then uh, we will talk about uh, various processes. For gold, there is a gravity separation which we will be discussing, and uh, silver and lead roasting and red reduction of smeltings, copper. Uh, carbothermic reduction of cuprites and iron and steel is melting of iron ore. So, we will be uh, discussing all these processes how Indians were making in ancient time. So, uh, if you look at gold, gold is a very very ductile metal and it has a higher corrosion and oxidation resistance. One gram of gold can be drawn into more than 1.24 kilometer long wire without any intermediate annealing. So, that is why it is being used very easily for jewelries. Very nice uh, you know jewelry you can find even today. Although it was being made earlier days in by hand nowadays machine is making. And I always emphasize that you know a hand is uh, you know should be kept or the or the what you call uh, this um, art of making 
the jewelry by hand must be kept so that mind will be developed uh, but as a gold is a soft material uh, then it cannot be really used for any war weapons uh, or any other places where the hardness is called for if you look at according to researcher uh, Neolithic men around maybe 4500-2000 BC would have the first become acquainted with native gold in India. In India not many gold artifacts dating to the pre-Harappan period have been reported. That is a very contradictory statement but however we could not get much. But in Vedic literature gold has been mentioned several times as Hiranya. So therefore, uh, it might be you know Vedic period gold uh, you know uh, having a prominence and the recurrence of this uh, metal in copper age particularly 5th millennium is more common and many artifacts have been reported from South India. And even today also the in South India the gold is considered to be the very important and they are having lot of uh, gold ornaments and also they uh, hoard a lot of golds. So, India has the distinction that the deepest ancient mines in the world for the gold come from the musky region of Karnataka with carbon dates from the mid one uh, first millennium BC. So, this is uh, you know one of the oldest gold mine in the entire world India is having and that I have shown here this is still you know it is uh, people are using it and they have done the open cast kind of things they were using you know very road in different ways. Kolar and Hathi gold mines were being worked even in prehistoric time and it has been proved beyond doubt that South Indians had learned the technology of mining gold, established the smelting technology on a commercial scale and metal was being traded through the Lothal by sea route to the Harappa, Mahindra, even Egypt, Greece, Rome and Africa and other countries. With this we will stop over here.